Welcome to Inner Guidance Channel, where imagination shapes reality. Join us as we dive deep into the profound teachings found within Neville Goddard's rare books and lectures, all available for free right here on our channel. Today we proudly present his remarkable lecture, Experience the Mystery of Christ in His Own Voice with Enhanced Audio Quality through AI Technology. The hostile attitude of the world to this great mystery of Jesus Christ is their ignorance of who the Father is. You will know who you really are, the heavenly being that came down into this world to the degree that you experience the mystery of Jesus Christ. And when you experience it, you will discover you are Jesus Christ. There never was another and never will be another. Just follow me closely in a little drama that is told us in the book of John. The word Pilate means closely pressed, like a contracted form, the limit, really, of contraction and of opacity. But like all these characters, they are personified, and these are attributes, these are qualities. To see the characters of Scripture as characters of history is to see truth tempered to the weakness of the human soul. They are all states, eternal states. So Pilate is not really a person, as you are a person, as I am a person. It's the contracted state. The story is taking place within you. So Pilate said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others tell you about it? Jan Bart 18, 33, 38. Do you know this from experience, or is it hearsay? You ask me the question, Am I king of the Jews? Now, he doesn't deny that he is. He simply is asked the question. But he wonders if this contracted state has reached the point of being broken now. It must reach the point where the shell is going to break, and then it will know of its own accord. And then he said, So you are a king? He said, You say that I am. For he had said, For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth, and then the contracted form asked the question, what is truth? Based upon this level, it is true that the pitcher is here, that the glass is here, that you are here, that I am here, but he is not speaking of this truth. The truth of which the true being that you are speaks is the true knowledge of God. He's not speaking of anything known to the world of science. Today we're on the way to the moon for the second time, but that is not the story of the Bible. He is speaking of the being that created the moon, that created the heavens, and that sustains the heavens. And he's trying to tell every being in the world that the being that did it, you are, but you have forgotten. You came down into this limit of contraction, this limit of opacity, and so do you know it now when you asked the question of your own accord, or were you told it by another? Did one tell you about me? Well then, you really do not know it. You've got to know it by having experienced it. So to the degree that man experiences the mystery of Christ, he understands Christ. Whether you call yourself the Pope or an ordinary minister or a layman, it means nothing. You could be someone washing floors tonight, who will know by experience who they really are. They'll know that they are Jesus Christ by having experienced Jesus Christ. Now let us turn to the poet Browning. He said, Truth is within ourselves. It takes no rise from outward things, what are you may believe. There is an inmost center in us all, where truth abides in fullness. And to know rather consists in opening out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape, than in effecting entry of a light supposed to be without. Paracelsus. He took three of the mighty I am statements in the book of John. I am the truth, I am the way, I am the light of the world, and incorporated them into this very short statement. There is an inmost center in us all where truth abides in fullness, not just a little bit, but in fullness. He likens this to an imprisoned splendor. And then he speaks of the way and the way is from within. To think that some Christ is coming from without is to misunderstand completely the great mystery. 
It's entirely within us. As you sit here now in this little room, and you seem to be so small in this enormous universe, and yet you seated here in this contracted state. And this contracted state is Pilate, who questions your sanity when you begin to stir within you and asks these questions. It's all between you. The whole contest is within the individual. And then that effulgence within comes out. It arouses itself. It awakes within this little garment and the creator of the universe comes out of the individual. I tell you, I know it from experience. You are not some little tiny being at all, no matter what the world will tell you. You've gone through hell and maybe you'll go through more. But the search is to find self. And the self you're seeking for is your father who is yourself. It's told in scripture, but told in such a strange and wonderful manner. And Jesus said, go and say unto him, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Rev down in 22, 16. I am the root, the origin, the father, and yet I am the offspring of David. I am the father of David. I am the offspring of David. Now read scripture. I will bring up out of you, O David. I will raise up a son that will come forth from your body. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. 2 Sam 7, 12. He shall say, I and my father are one, Jenna 10:30. He's coming out of David, therefore he's David's son. And David is the son of that which created the whole vast universe. Yet, he who created the whole vast universe brings out of the universe that which is himself that was buried within the universe. So here, the grandfather and the grandson are one and the same being coming out of that which God created, which is the universe. Humanity is David, and he draws out of humanity that which is himself. The grandfather and the grandson are one and the same being. So go and say, I am the root and the offspring of David. But if you see David as the world sees David, you will never see the mystery. I am telling you who he is. He is humanity reduced to a single being. And when you look at that wonderful boy and you see him, he is your son, but he brought forth you, for you buried yourself in humanity and played all the parts, every part. At the very end, you extricate yourself from your own creation and you redeem your creation. For your creation became condensed into one single being standing before you as your son, and he's the David of biblical fame. Now he said, I am from above, you are from below, John 8, 23. He's speaking within himself. Above and within are one and the same. Below and without are one and the same. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from below expresses that which is of the earth earthy, John 3, 31. Here we find in the book of John that the outstanding, in fact, the one thing that they cannot take in this revelation is his revelation of the fatherhood of God. They have an entirely different concept of who the father is. I tell you, you are the father. Maybe you can't even this night pay rent. Maybe the cupboard is bare. Maybe you are in debt and you created the universe and you sustain the universe. The being that you're going to discover that you really are is the creator of the universe and there is no other God. There's no room in the universe for two gods. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deut 6, Spa. So when asked to name the greatest of all the commandments, he didn't mention any of the ten. He mentioned the confession of faith of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mark 12 to 29. Now he gives a second commandment, which is not new. You'll read it in Matthew, love thy neighbor as thyself, 2239, because it is yourself. The whole vast world is yourself pushed out. The day will come that you'll discover that the whole thing is yourself pushed out. And only as you change your attitude towards what is pushed out, can it change. 
it cannot change of itself. Only as I change within me, my attitude towards you, can you change towards me. It all begins that I love him. Why? Because he first loved me, 1 JN 4, 19. Well, the he spoken of is the I am of you. So you want someone to love you or to see you differently. You start by changing your attitude toward the aspect of yourself that is projected. The whole vast world is yourself projected. So you want something different to come from that projection? Well then, because I first loved him. Then if it's all in me, well, I change it within me. And then the whole vast world, if I change it within me, must conform to the changes within me. So he comes to speak of the truth, which is a different truth altogether. It is the knowledge of God. So he said, I am the truth. Well, if there is an inmost center in us all wherein truth abides in fullness, and here is one called Jesus Christ, saying, I am the truth, and that is the center in me, then where is he? The only one that can resurrect is Jesus Christ, and he's in me. He resurrects in me and breaks the shell, and then he comes out. As he comes out, I am set free, free as the wind, and I gradually discover who I really am. Night after night, I become more aware that I am the creator of it all. So when someone dies in this world, where do you think they go? To the cemetery to impoverish the relative who put them there. In the world of Caesar, that appears to be true. No, he goes within me. There is no place for him to go other than to return to me. Everyone in this world who dies returns to me, for I am the center. But you can say the same thing because there is only one center. They all come back within me. This morning as I was waking, I met a friend of mine who dropped suddenly at the age of 64. He had just retired and had a lovely retirement fund all built up. He worked for Standard Oil of California and he was the head of the personnel department. He said to his wife on the day he died, they went shopping in the morning, they went off and did many things. And then he said to her, have you any time to give me just for a moment? She said, certainly. So she came in and they sat at his desk and he had 17 items to go over. He took them one by one and said, do you understand this? And Muriel said, yes, I do. I think I do. Now he told the second one, explained it in detail, went all the way down the list. And she said to each one, yes, I think I understand. Then he came to the last item. Now you're sure you understand this one? And she said, yes, I'm quite sure I understand that. She had no sooner said, I think I understand it. Then he went right over and he was gone. Well, this morning he was with me, a delightful soul. I've known him for the last, well, I would say since 1947. I think I met him, no, the first year, 46, when I first came out. I've seen him every year in my visits here and my visits to San Francisco. But this morning he came and told me what a delightful passage it was. It was so easy. It was just a normal, normal conversation with my friend Al. He was a Swede, Al Olstrom. And here he told me of this perfectly lovely departure. But Al is the same Al. He would not listen to me here. No, he loved my company socially to get together for a few drinks and a lovely barbecue. And when I entertained him in San Francisco, I had no barbecue, so I would take him to the club or to a restaurant. But every year we interchange these visits. I would go to his home one year and he would come to my hotel next year. It was always on that level. He never came to my meetings after the first three or four. It didn't interest him. He liked to sit down on Sunday morning and play the old hymns and cry, just simply cry, playing all the lovely old hymns, and that satisfied him. But to listen to this revelation, no, it just didn't make any sense at all to him. So I met the owl that I knew here, and he hadn't changed one iota. He's the same owl, and he's in me. Where else would I have met him this morning?
I was coming back from the depth of my soul. Having told the story to those on higher levels of my being, who could hear it with understanding, and coming through here, is Al. Just long enough to greet him in this lovely manner. And strangely enough, where do you think I found him? In a railroad station, sitting at the counter, having just a little snack. There he was, just long enough to see him in the same manner in which I left him here. That was all that he wanted of me, to join me in a little snack or a big snack, but simply a physical meal. That was the owl that I knew, and he's the same owl, hasn't changed at all. He denied the fatherhood of God as I experienced the fatherhood of God. He had his own fatherhood of God, and he would sit down and cry his eyes out while he played his lovely old hymns, Nearer my God to thee, and God was away out in space, and all these things he played. When I told him of the only God, the God that is housed within us, and only to the extent that we experience Jesus Christ do we understand Jesus Christ? Oh, no. He had his own little Jesus Christ, and no one's going to rob him of that. Same Al. So I tell you, the denial of Jesus Christ was simply his revelation of the fatherhood. They could not accept for one moment what he was telling them of the father. So when he said, I go unto my father and your father, to my God and your God, and I and my father are one, Gen 17, 20, Gen 10, 30. Therefore, I and your father are one, and therefore you and I are one. They could not believe that. That was too much, so they rejected him. And those who call themselves Christians today still reject him because they have these little icons out in space and worship some stupid little concept of the mind. They will not believe in the revelation coming from within them. I tell you, you are God, and you are God the Father, the Father of humanity, the whole of humanity. It's a play. This is the most wonderful theatrical play ever conceived, and God is playing all the parts. When he's played all the parts, the same God that is now in you breathing, when he's played them all in you, he breaks the shell. He breaks that pilot, and then you, the God, are self-born, and you come out. You return to yourself the being that you really are, for there is only God. There, nothing but God. So, everyone in the world is playing the eternal play, and that play is so beautifully told in Scripture. When one thinks for a moment, the only Scripture known when the revelation was made was the Old Testament. Every quotation in the new has to be from the old, for there was no new. Now he interprets the old by telling you exactly what it meant. I could give you passage after passage in the book of John to show you what he's talking about concerning the discovery of the Father. Starting off even with the very beginning, take the 18th verse of the first chapter, no one has ever seen God. He who is in the bosom of the Father God only begotten, he has made him known. I am quoting now from the oldest manuscripts, the three oldest manuscripts quoted in that manner. In the fourth century, the word son was substituted for the word God, which I will not quarrel with at all. So it now reads, the son, the only begotten son. It read originally, God only begotten, he's begetting himself. Yet I can't deny that when you do see that, out of which he comes, that the sum total of all humanity, the whole world of men and women, fused into a single whole becomes a single you, and it is his son. He calls you father, and you know he is your son, and you know you are his father. You know it. So I do not blame the one in the fourth century who changed the word from God to son, and rearrange the sentence from God only begotten to the only begotten Son. But that's how it reads in the earliest manuscripts. No one has seen God. He who is in the bosom of the Father. He tells you exactly now God is Father. God only begotten, he has made him known. Well, I'm telling you that my mission is to let you know who that Son is. You will not find it in any work that I know of save the Bible. But the Bible is something that is so strange 
that people do not even see it. Priests do not see it, rabbis do not see it, and ministers do not see it. But I am telling you what I know from my own experience. It is David who is that only begotten son. There is no other son. The Bible tells it to you, but they do not see it because they rearrange scripture to suit the traditions of the churches. And you never hear any bold affirmation in scripture concerning, I am the traditions, I am the conventions, but I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life, I am the resurrection. John Dudrein 14, by, you hear these. These are the bold mighty I am sayings, but never I am the conventions, I am the traditions. So we are hiding from ourselves if we keep alive the conventions. And it's now part of the conventions to say that Jesus Christ is his son. But our Bible has been changed over and over and over again by men who had no vision, who could not see it. Now here is a vision that I'll share with you tonight. My friend is not here, but she gave me the letter last lecture. She found herself in a casino you see, everything has within itself the capacity for symbolic significance. So she is now in a gambling casino, and the owner is coming towards her with a stick to count off her winnings. Instead of counting off what you would in any casino, say, the little chips that you have, it is a long French loaf, sliced but still held together because it hadn't gone right through. It's been sliced right down, but not completely through the entire loaf. So it's a long French loaf. So he comes with his stick and he simply touches. As he taps a slice, she calls off $50 and he repeats $50. She repeats it again. And then she said $100, $100. Everything she said he had to repeat. And he was getting more and more purpley and explosive and annoyed because she would call the number and he had to repeat what she said and it was one more slice of the loaf. She enjoyed, there was some peculiar thrill in her bones that he was so annoyed with her and disliked her heartily, but she was just simply winning all the money. It came down to the end, the very last was the last end of the loaf, and she wondered in her mind's eye, what number will I call now? The number came to her, 150, and he called it. That was the entire loaf. The whole thing bled. The loaf of bread bled. It oozed out like a rare piece of roast beef when it sliced, and the whole loaf turned into blood, and yet it was bread. And the number tone is seven, spiritual perfection, 150. You're told in scripture, the sixth chapter of John, speaking of the bread, it is my body. Unless you eat my body, and drink my blood, you have no life in you, for the life is in the blood. 651 56. Well, here is the most perfect vision, and she certainly has the perfect vision of the symbolism of Scripture. She said, I, I don't understand it, Neville, but it was fun as I watched his face getting more and more purpley as he was actually ticking off these slices, as I called them by number. The very end, I wondered, what number? And I said, all right, 1,150. I don't understand it, but it is perfect. Perfect symbolism of scripture. Number seven, the perfect number spiritually. She had completed the loaf and the whole thing is now alive and oozing blood. That is the blood. She has accepted completely the body of Jesus Christ as her own wonderful human imagination. That is the body of God. She has completely accepted it, and she blames no one now. If anyone is to blame, it's only herself, and she knows it's only herself. When you get to that point that you can't blame another, you have to eat it all by yourself, because you've accepted completely that your own wonderful imagination is the cause of the phenomena of life. Then you've eaten the loaf of bread, and then it turns into blood. The whole thing was oozing blood. The whole loaf became a bleeding piece of flesh. Eat my body and drink my blood. Well, I tell you, 
your letters of last Monday were thrilling beyond measure. One gentleman said he found himself in a place like the bowl, and here someone received the baton, a long-haired maestro. Innately, he knew that that same performance would take place again for those who did not witness it. So he drove up to the knoll, where he knew it would once more be presented to the same long-haired maestro. While he was there, and it was, it was presented, a lady next to him said, what is that in the sky? He took binoculars and he looked up, wondering whether it was an airplane or what, and it was a multicolored bird resembling a parrot because it could speak. The bird said to him, get out of here. We don't want any part of you people. And then it came down and whacked him on the face with its wings. Now you will think that is an idle dream. It's not an idle dream at all. That's a wonderful adumbration of what will take place the next time. But this time it will not be the multicolored parrot. It will be the dove. They avoid man. I know that from experience because man gives off on this level the most outrageous odor. And it was a woman in his vision. It was not a man who asked him to see what the object was in space. It is a woman when it comes to who will turn to you and say, they avoid man. But he so loves you that he penetrated the ring of offense to demonstrate his love for you. So it's a marvelous foreshadowing of what is in store for him. Another lady saw me dying. So many of you have been seeing me dead recently. May I tell you it's healthy, it's a very healthy state, very healthy. She was with the very one whose eyes are now in current witnesses. And here, as she looked and I was dying, no possibility of reviving me. And she knew that my friend with the incurrent eyes so loved me, she didn't want me to die. She, on the other hand, who is having the vision, didn't want me to be touched by anyone and hold me back. Because if you touch him, you're going to hold him back, and then he will not be set free. Then I collapsed to the floor, and then I was gone. It's a wonderful vision for her to have. For unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and thou with me. Wouldest thou love one who had never died for thee, or ever die for one who had not deed for thee? And if God deeth not for man and giveth not himself eternally for man, man could not exist. Blake Jerusalem, Plot 96. So God deis. I am telling you, I have awakened from the dream of life. I have been born from above, and the only one who is born from above is God. And so God dies. It's a perpetual dying. That all may live. So she saw it beautifully. I can't congratulate her enough. Her vision was perfect in this that she shared with me. I can't give the whole evening to all the visions, but they were perfectly wonderful. What you gave to me last Monday, one after the other, and everyone as lovely as the other. So I'm not here to flatter you. I'm here to tell you the truth as I have experienced it. Browning was right based on a vision. There is an inmost center in us all where truth abides in fullness and to know, know what? The true knowledge of God. He's not trying to break through from without, but from within and to release this imprisoned splendor. It comes from within. Listen to the story, believe it implicitly and the crust will break and he will come out. And it's an effulgence. You are radiant light. Whatever it touches, it transforms into beauty, into perfection, for you are perfect. You can't go any place where you are not perfect. Well, I tell for when you inherit the kingdom, as we told you last Monday night, as told us in the 25th of Matthew, come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That kingdom is a body. The body is perfect and it was from the foundation of the world. So you awaken into that body, and wherever that body is, heaven is. That's the realm. You don't inherit a realm. You inherit a body. So wherever that body is, the whole vast world that is now reflecting, it is perfect. You can't come upon anything that is imperfect. And if it was before you got there, instantly, automatically, 
it is transformed into perfection because you are perfect. That is what is in store for you. Come, blessed of my Father, enter into and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So when this body awakens, I can't tell you the beauty, I can't describe it to you. As he said in that fifth chapter of John, no one, speaking now to the one below, no one has heard his voice, no one has ever seen his form, but I know thee, O Lord, 537. He is telling those around about him, you have not heard the voice, you have not seen his form, but I know thee, O Lord. The world has not known thee, O Father, but I know thee. And now he turns to a few, a remnant. He's speaking now to his disciples. He said, and they know that thou hast sent me. He has found a few who really believe his story and they will spread it and they'll keep on spreading it. They will hear it first by hearsay. Eventually they will know it from experience. So this is the truth of which he spoke. It's the true knowledge of God. Anyone who talks about any God outside of you, turn your ears away, turn your attention away from him. There is no external God. You see this fabulous external world, but there is no external God. He who supports the whole thing is within you, and it was he who created it. It's almost, well, the world calls it blasphemy to say this. Let them call it by any name that they wish. I tell you that it is true. The day will come, you'll crack the shell, and he who is now, the imprisoned splendor within you, will come out, and memory will return, and you will know all that you knew before that the world was. By coming down into this world and taking on the limitations of the flesh, you will now expand yourself beyond what it was prior to the coming down into the world. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. Gen 10, 18. So he came down of his own accord because there is no one else. And he came down as us because it takes all of us to form the one. We are the Elohim. The name is a plural name. Elohim is plural. It first appears in the Bible in the very first verse, in the beginning God, that's Elohim, Gen 1, 1. And the Elohim said, let us make man in our image. That's Elohim, Gen 1, 26. Then the Lord took his place in the divine council. That word translated Lord is Elohim, Pas 82, 1. And he said to us, I say ye are gods, sons of the most high, Pas 82, 6. That word gods is Elohim. So it takes all of us. It takes humanity together to form the one God that created the whole vast universe and sustains it. So he's not speaking of anything on the outside. Let man on the outside find new planets, new ways to get to them, new energies in the world, new everything, and we're all for it. Why not enjoy the world while we're in it? So I'm all for it. But that is not the truth of which the scripture speaks. He speaks of the true knowledge of God. That's all the truth that he's talking about. You'll find in scripture that no effort is made to change society. He doesn't change anything in the world. He says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Luke 20, 25. He doesn't try to make the one who is in prison as a slave, a free person, leave him just as he is. And today, all of our energies are going into changing everything in the world. I received a notice here recently, as I think I told you, from Health, Education and Welfare. Well, I thought it was only concerning my health. And instead of carrying my blue cross, as I have for years, for my family, well, if the government will take it over, because I've paid in all this money since I began to pay, which was the very first month it came into being back in 1936, I think it was, when I became eligible to pay my social security. So I went down today and she's asking me all kinds of questions that were not related to my health, all related to my retirement fund. Well, I said that I'm not retiring and I came here because this was all about what I thought was health insurance. 
if I had to go to the hospital or to get a doctor. She said that's part of it here too. She didn't ask me any of these questions. She's asking me all kinds of things about my insurance. The she said to me, you don't have to answer any other questions because we have it all anyway. She only confirmed my suspicion that we're all numbers. We're all computerized. She has all the material in the world and she need not have asked me one question, not one question. I gave her my passport, my only identity. I don't have a driver's license because I don't drive. I have no car. Well, what proof do you have that you really are 65 this coming February? I said, my passport, and here it is. Well, that is not the proof. Do you have a birth certificate? I said, they didn't have them where I was born. Not in the year I was born. That was too expensive. Why have birth certificates? But I was baptized, and somewhere I know I had the certificate, but I can't find it now. She said, try and find it for me, or write for it, because we must have some proof that you really are going to be 65 this coming February. But do you know, all these things were already known. I didn't have to go there at all. They knew exactly what I paid in taxes, what I declared, what I didn't declare, everything they know about me. So no one is really doing anything but what the government has, the whole little thing all right before him. But you are not that. You created the whole vast world, so don't let anyone scare you. If you go down, this was a very sweet lady, a delightful lady, and she could not have been kinder, could not have been sweeter. You would have thought she was my sister. She was so kind. Nevertheless, they know everything about you. But if you don't find one as I found one, don't let them scare you. Because in you, as in the one who's going to question you, is the only God. There is no other God. The God that created the whole vast universe is within you. And you can prove it on this level, even though the body has not yet been broken, where the birth has taken place. You can prove it by simply imagining certain states and do not raise one finger to make it so. Believe it to be so. Go about your business as though it were true. And may I tell you, it will happen because that is the way everything came into being as you brought it into being. While you're here, you have forgotten. But I am trying to remind you of the way that you brought it into being. You brought it into being by imagining, and now you can simply bring things into your world by imagining. There isn't a thing in this world that wasn't first imagined. So you imagine what it would be like if you were the man, the woman that you would like to be, and then you sustain that imaginal act as though it were true. No power in the world can stop it from becoming true because there is no other power. If you believe it, there is no other power in the world that can stop it. Now try it, beginning tonight. Take a glorious concept, nothing less than the best, the very best, and simply imagine it to be true about you and those that you love. Start with your immediate circle. And although at the moment our circle may deny it by reason of what they're doing, you persist. You persist in that assumption as though it were true. And may I tell you, it will harden into fact because there is no other creative power. Name it by any other name. There is no other creative power. Grant all of your brothers who are still asleep to pursue God in some other direction. They'll never find him in any other way than by experiencing the story of Jesus Christ. They will not find him in all the laboratories in the world. They can take the little pieces apart and find out how they are put together, but they'll not find the father. The father is the one who is looking, the one who is seeking and they're looking for something on the outside, and the Father is within them. He will never reveal himself save through David. You'll never find the Father save through David. 
Do you wonder why the Jewish faith denied the story when no one said he was the father of David? And it's been done so long now, for 2,000 years, and no priest dares say it because they have been brainwashed into believing that it's not. They think God is another, and Jesus Christ is something less, and he is the Son. They don't know that Jesus Christ is God the Father. It is a pattern. It's the pattern in man, buried in man, and it erupts in man, awakens in man. When it awakens in man, he is a father. Therefore, who is the Son? David. Now go back to the end of the Bible, the 22nd chapter of Revelation, and Jesus is speaking. I am the root and the offspring of David, 22:16. The root is the origin that is the father. The offspring is the child. But if I am both, I am the root and the offspring, they are one being. Therefore, what is David now? He didn't say that he was David. He said, I am the root and the offspring of David. Well, now he used David. So if the root and the offspring are one and the same, then who is David? He tells you the offspring of David, so David is a father. But the root is the father of David, and he is the root, so he is the father of David. Yet, the father of David is one with the son of David. So here, the grandfather and the grandson are one being. Therefore, who is David? Well, David is his son. He is one with his grandson. The son is David, which is humanity altogether fused into one being, and personified as a single youth, the eternal youth. Well, that is what I have come to give to the world. I have never read it in a book. I have never heard it from the lips of any other person, but I have experienced it. And so I tell you what I know from experience. I am not theorizing. The whole vast world could rise in opposition. It would make no difference to me. I would say to them, as Peter and John said to the Sanhedrin, on the day when they told them not to speak any more in the name of Jesus, and they answered, If it be right in the eyes of God to listen to you rather than to God, you be the judge. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Acts 4, 19. So I cannot but speak of what I have experienced, and I have experienced being the father of David. And in searching through the only scripture, which is the Old Testament, I have found confirmation there. I have found David, and he has cried unto me, Thou art my father, Pes 89, 26. And, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, Pes 2, 7. So I found it all in scripture, and I did not know it until it happened to me on that sixth day of December back in 1959. So I'm telling you this, and I know that here in this audience there are those who believe me. They say, O righteous father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these believe that thou hast sent me. Genbone 17, 25. Now let us go into the silence. 